Where are we? Okay. Okay, is that working? Am I plugged in? Yes. Okay, everybody, I might as well start. It's actually three minutes past, but since you're all here and Nick finished early, I might start now because otherwise I'll never finish. So, um, right, so today, and we hope this is working. Okay, so today, this is your last. Um, I think gross anatomy lecture um, I'm not sure actually but basically it's the last region that we're going to do and we're doing the leg and foot so I've got a lot to get through I'm going to cover the ankle first and then we'll look at the joints I'm going to do the compartments and muscles of the leg before I do the arches of the foot Okay, so I've just rearranged um, the slides are in the right order, but the lecture notes, you'll find the arches come before the, um, the leg muscles. Okay? So, we need to remember the, uh, the features of the, uh, of the distal end of the, um, of the tibia and the fibula, which are bones that you covered when we did the knee. Um, and I'll label them in some other diagrams in a moment, but just to remind you, you know up the top we've got the condyle and the tuberosity of the tibia. Now extending downwards from that is a very sharp border and that's the anterior border of the tibia. And on the medial side of that, um, sort of, which is technically the medial border, this, this here separates medial and lateral borders. Now the medial border of the, or medial surface I should say, of the, of the tibia is entirely palpable. That's what you call your shin, okay? And you can feel the sharp anterior border on the front of your tibia as well, okay? But you can palpate this surface all the way down to there and down at the ankle it becomes what is known as the medial malleolus, okay? We'll label it in another diagram later. Um, it has, on this side, it has a fibula notch there where the fibula sort of fits in and forms a joint there. That's the distal tibiofibular joint. There's also an articular surface on the inferior side there and the inside of the medial malleolus and that's going to form the ankle joint, which we'll do in a moment. Um, Okay, the bo bone, when you actually look at it, is triangular in cross-section, but we can go through that a bit later. Now, the other bone of the leg there is the fibula, 
Um, the fibula is a bone which is actually quite complicated because its shaft twists around on itself. So you don't need to learn the borders or anything of the, uh, of the fibula, but you need to know that the head, which is the sort of rounded end, sits up at the proximal end of the bone, and that's going to articulate with a facet that's on the sort of posteroinferior surface of the lateral condyle of the tibia. Okay, now that is a, that, and that forms a little synovial joint there called the, uh, the proximal tibiofibular joint. So that one provides a, for a little bit of movement, but not very much, okay? And it's thickened at the front by ligaments, but you don't need to know that, the details of those. What I want you to remember is that it's not part of the knee joint, right? It's completely separate to the knee joint, whereas at the elbow you had both the arm bones involved in the elbow joint. The knee only involves the tibia, the fibula is a separate um, bone. Now, the, uh, the tibia and the, uh, the fibula have this proximal joint at the end. Then in between, there's an interosseous border on the uh, lateral side of the tibia and on the medial side of the fibula. And as you can see there, we have fibres that are passing sort of upwards from the fibula towards the, uh, the tibia there. And they're similar in function to the, um, to the interosseous membrane in the upper limb, so it can transmit forces. But its main function here is to provide attachment for muscles of the leg. Okay? Now down the bottom, this joint down here is actually a, uh, a fibrous joint. Technically that's a fibrous joint as well because it's just connective tissue fibres joining the bones. But down the bottom here where we have the sort of fibula notch on the, the, the tibia there and the corresponding surface of the fibula, there's just fibres, collagen fibres joining those bones. There's no synovial cavity. So that's actually another um, fibrous joint. Okay? And the distal end of the, the uh, fibula forms the lateral malleolus. So that's the lateral bump on your ankles and it extends a little bit more, more distally than the, uh, than the medial one. So there are the joints that I was just talking about, and down here is the distal tibiofibular joint, which has interosseous fibres and then um, anterior and posterior fibres, but it's really just connective tissue holding those bones together. Okay? Um, so now we need to do the foot bones. And I have given you a diagram, if you bother to print it, of the, uh, of the foot bones. I'm not sure, does my diagram correspond? Yes, it does. It's the same foot. Okay, so this is a right foot. And we're looking down on a right foot from above. Okay. So, if we, uh, if we label these, now the key bone here for the ankle joint is this one, labelled T, and that is the talus. Okay. Now the talus um, is broken up into, into several parts and it's the bone that will form the ankle joint, right? It has a body, its posterior part is the, uh, is the body of the talus, right? That's the sort of thick main part of the, uh, of the talus. But then there's a sort of um, a narrowing about here and that forms the neck of the talus. And then the area anterior to that is rounded and forms the head of the talus. This little bit on the top, that, that, that T or the, the, um, that we've labelled there is the trochlea. Now the trochlea means a pulley and that's really the name that we give to the sort of uh, the region of the talus that contains the articular surface. Okay, so that's actually the trochlea of the talus and that's going to articulate with the, uh, at the leg bones above. Okay? Now while we're here we might as well name the other foot bones and so the talus is sitting on top of the ankle bone, I mean the heel bone I should say and that bone is this one and that's the calcaneus, sometimes pronounced calcaneus but I use the, the English pronunciation which is calcaneus. Um, now the one feature of the calcaneus that you need to be aware of is on the back here there's a sort of thickening and it's a, actually a little projection going upwards. That's called the tuber 
how can AI? And you've probably encountered that the other day because that's the insertion of the Achilles tendon or the tendo-calcaneus. Okay? Now, um, in front of the calcaneus, we have another five tarsal bones. So there are seven tarsal bones, and you might remember there were eight carpal bones in the hand. One of those carpal bones is actually a sesamoid bone for flexor carpi ulnaris, and that's the pisiform. It's not a true carpal bone in the sense that it doesn't you know, sit in the, with the, in the same relationship as the other carpal bones. So down here we've actually only got seven tarsal bones. Okay? Now the one in front of the talus that the head of the talus articulates with is called the navicular. I think they, someone thought it was shaped like a boat and so navy means boat. Okay? Now the navicular does have a thickening on its medial side and that is the tuberosity of the, uh, of the navicular. Okay? Now lateral to that is the cuboid which is a fairly large bone and that's this one here and it's part of what we would call the distal row of tarsal bones and then medial to that are three bones which are sort of slightly wedge shaped and so they are called cuneiform bones and there is a uh, medial cuneiform, there's an intermediate one, whoops, that's going to there, and there is a lateral cuneiform bone. Okay, so they complete our tarsal bones. Now anterior to that we've got the metatarsals, five metatarsals, numbered one to five from the big toe laterally. And on the fifth one, it's worth noting that there is a sort of protrusion there, which is the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal. And you can palpate that. That's about halfway along the lateral side of your foot. You can feel that. My diagram doesn't have the remaining bones, but I think you know, you, they're pretty similar to the bones that we saw in the, uh, in the upper limb. So we've got, um, for the big toe, we have two phalanges and then there are three phalanges for each of the other toes. Even your little toe has three phalanges. Sometimes they do fuse as we get older though in the small toes, particularly in the, uh, in the little toe. Okay? So those are the, uh, are the bones for the ankle and this is a side view of those, um, those bones. So that's, where is it? There we are. Okay. And on this one, um, I just wanted to point out, so there's the calcaneus. That's the tuber calcanei at the back there. And this here is a medial view of the, lo the foot bones. So that there will be the medial malleolus of the tibia. Okay sitting there. And the bone that we can see under there, of course, is the talus. Okay. Now there's one more thing that I wanted to point out. Um, when, and this, is, this here is a coronal section, okay, as if you've sliced through it that way. And then this one was a lateral view. So we've got them all together here on the one page. On the, on the, this thing here, extending from the medial side, so there's our calcaneus, fibula and tibia up there and this is the talus okay in there and what we can see is that there's this shelf of bone here and it's, mar it's, it's actually that thing there on the other diagram and that's called the sustentaculum tali okay sustentaculum tali and that's it there I'll just abbreviate it on that one Okay, and that actually is quite important because it forms part of the articulation with the, uh, with the talus and the calcaneus below, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so that's the, uh, the medial side and if we put in there, that's the navicular and that one there is the medial cuneiform bone. There's the first metatarsal. And what you can actually see, and I don't know if you noticed it, oh, I haven't shown you the inferior view yet, but our weight gets distributed 
sort of backwards down about 50% to the heel bone and about 50% of the weight goes forward. And sitting under the head of the first metatarsal is a sesamoid bone. Okay? And there's actually a pair of sesamoid bones there. And we actually stand on those, the front of our foot, they take about 25% of our weight. Okay, and I'll talk about them a little bit later. So what we need to um, think about now is the uh, ankle joint. And this joint's important because this is the most commonly injured large joint in the body. And I bet there's a whole pile of you who've or have sprained your ankle at some stage in your lives or will sprain them in the future. Um, and so here we can see the bones that form the ankle and it's essentially it's a hinge joint, okay, and there is the, the trochlea of the talus and that sort of, oh, remember firstly that these two bones are united by fibrous tissue so they're going to create a, uh, a socket for the trochlea of the talus to sit in, okay, and that basically those three bones collectively form the ankle joint. So you can see um, here is a superior view of the talus and something to notice here right, is that the, the trochlea of the talus is wider at the front than it is at the back and that has implications for ankle stability. Okay? So we're looking here now at our ankle joint and as we said it's a hinge. It has its, the movements that are occurring there are dorsiflexion which is to point the toes upwards and plantar flexion which is to point the toes down. So when our foot is on the ground it's in the dorsiflexed position. Okay? Now the ankle is a hinge joint. It is a simple, you know, as far as the, the articular um, ca uh, um, capsule goes, okay, it just attaches around the margins of the articular surface. Of, uh, surrounding the joint. Okay, so it'll go from the articular margins of the um, of the tibia and the fibula down onto the talus. Okay, now um, because it is a hinge joint, it needs ligaments to prevent medial and lateral movements there, and we know already that those are called collateral movement, uh, collateral ligaments. So. Um, what we're going to do on this one down here is we're going to draw the medial ligament. Now this is a thickening of the medial side of the, uh, the ankle joint capsule and, um, and, so, and it's called, another name for the medial ligament is actually the deltoid ligament. Okay? It's commonly called the deltoid ligament and that's because it's shaped like a triangle, the Greek letter delta. Now it originates from the medial malleolus here and basically what it does, it has fibres that go down to the substantaculum tali. There are fibres here at the front just going to the talus. There are fibres coming forward onto the navicular okay, as well. Now you'll see that there's a little gap there between where the head of the talus here is articulating in front with the navicular and below with the calcaneus, but there's a gap there, okay? And this gap is actually filled by a really important ligament there and that ligament is known as the spring ligament, okay, that's the easy name for it, but it's also, if you want to know its long name, is the plantar calcaneo navicular ligament. So now you know why it's easier to call it the spring ligament. Okay? So that actually sits and fills the gap between the navicular and the calcaneus. And in fact the fibres of the deltoid ligament, the medial ligament of the ankle, also go down and attach onto the spring ligament there. Okay? So that is the deltoid or medial ligament of the ankle and that's going to, oh well I'll talk a little bit more about what they do later, I've got some nice pictures for you. Now on the lateral side, the, um, the ligament on the lateral side of the ankle is much much weaker 
Okay, so on this diagram you can see there's the spring ligament and then you can see the, uh, oh I didn't show you the posterior fibres as well, Woo. going back onto the talus there. Okay, so if we move on, this is the lateral ligament. Now the lateral ligament rather than being a thick band that, thickens, that is just a thickening of the capsule, it's made up of three separate bands and um, collectively they form the, uh, the lateral ligament of the, uh, of the ankle. So what we're going to do is to draw those. Now on the, on the outside here we've got the fibula, we've got the calcaneus there and that of course is the talus. Okay, now coming from the lateral um, uh, malleolus of the fibula, we've got fibres. There's one lot of fibres that sort of go down and back slightly. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Okay, so we've got those fibres there. We've got some anterior fibres going to the talus and we've also got some posterior fibres. So it's made up of these three bands and they are named so that, you know, we've got anterior um, talofibula here, we've got posterior talofibula, whoops, and we've got this one's called the calcaneo fibula ligament. I don't know why the names are going backwards from the foot to the fibula. I have no idea why they were named accordingly like that, but that's the way it, the way it is, okay? So those are our lateral ligaments. Now, I'm, before I start talking about the functional stuff for the ankle, I want to mention the other joints of the foot and um, these joints are the joints between the tarsal bones. We'll come back to this one, okay? So we've got joints between the tarsal bones and there is a joint known, an important joint known as the transverse tarsal joint and it's this one here. Okay, so it's between the calcaneus and the talus behind and the um, cuboid and the navicular in front. So on here we can see it's basically um, this joint going across there. That's our transverse tarsal joint. But it's actually divided up into two joints so that there is, and they've got separate capsules, they're synovial, so we've got one joint here, right, between, which is that one sort of going across there, between the, uh, the head of the talus and the uh, navicular, navicular, and that's the talocalcaneo navicular joint because underneath we've got part of the calcaneus involved as well. And then the more lateral one is the calcaneo cuboid joint, okay, between the calcaneus and the, uh, and the cuboid bones. And they do, as I said, have separate um, capsules. The other joint that's important is this one here. And this one is between the inferior surface of the talus and the superior surface of the calcaneus. So the talus is sitting on top of the calcaneus and that one is known, can't label it there anyway, that one's known as the subtalar joint. So um, we're going. To, that's this joint here is the subtalar joint. Okay. Whereas that one going across there, of course, is the talocrural. That's the other name, by the way, for the ankle ankle joint up the top there. Okay. Now the uh, the there are. This is the transverse tarsal joint. So um, we've got, and this in this dissection, and we've actually got one of these in the uh, in the lab. We actually have, you can see where they've taken the talus off. Okay, the talus has been removed. So there's the articular surface there for the subtalar joint, and this here is the articular surface for the talocalcaneo navicular. So this is the medial side of that transverse tarsal joint and the head of the talus would sit here but this is a socket and it's actually a ball and socket joint, okay? The head of the talus forming the ball and the socket down here is formed by, at the front, the posterior surface of the navicular, it's got the sustentaculum tali and other parts of the calcaneus behind 
And then, as I mentioned before, the spring ligament fills the gap between those bones. And it is actually covered by articular cartilage on its superior surface. So that spring ligament actually forms part of the socket okay, for this particular joint. Um, now, the calcaneocuboid joint okay, is sitting lateral to that here. And as the, both of them have a, just a normal synovial capsule. Now, there are some other ligaments that are associated with these that help to strengthen them, and they're on the bottom of the foot, so we're going to draw them onto this one. Okay. Now, just to get, me, get you oriented there, that's the navicular there. This one here is the cuboid. And then we've got medial, intermediate, lateral cuneiform bones, and this one back here is the calcaneus. And you can see the two little sesamoid bones there that we stand off at the front here. Okay. Um, right, so if we wanted to put some ligaments onto here, we can actually put our spring ligament. There's the spring ligament. Right? And that's, and that's forming the lower part of the socket. So there's the spring ligament going from the substantaculum tali back there to the navicular. Now, lateral to that and reinforcing the, cal the, the lateral part of the transverse tarsal joint, we've got calcaneocuboid ligaments, but they're called plantar, long and short plantar ligaments. So here, going from the front of the calcaneus onto the cuboid there, okay, that one is the short plantar ligament. And then there are some other fibres which go over the top. They actually come from further back on the back of the, the, the bone here and they go forwards over the top of the others and they actually go to the cuboid at the front. They also send some little fibres out onto the bases of the metatarsals as well. And that red one is called the long plantar ligament. Can you see that? Yes. So it partly covers the, uh, the short one. Okay. So there they are on this diagram. There's the short plant. There's the spring ligament, and there's the short plantar ligament. If you hadn't figured that out, we're looking at the foot from below, and there's the long plantar ligament, basically covering most of the short one. Okay. So those ligaments, base those three ligaments basically reinforce our calcaneocuboid joint. Okay? Now the movements that occur at the, the subtalar and the transverse tarsal joints are inversion and eversion of the foot. All the ankle does is dorsiflex and plantar flex, right? The ankle joint proper. And these other movements occur at the joints between the tarsal bones. So inversion is to turn your foot so the sole faces inwards and eversion is to turn it so that the, the sole faces outwards. Okay? And really the functions of the ligaments of the ankle are to resist those medial and lateral ligaments. They stabilise the ankle joint but they actually resist the movements of inversion and eversion. They allow dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, but they limit the range of those movements. Okay? So one of the things that I... I'll go back actually a few slides. Well, you'll remember that we, I said that the, if we go look at the top of the talus... Where is it? Go back. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. If we look at the top of the talus, I said at the back it's narrower than it is at the front. So that when the foot is in the dorsiflex position, okay, the front of the talus is sitting up inside that socket and it completely fills the socket. So that means that, that you actually can't invert and invert your foot when it's dorsiflex anyway. But um, it basically, um, what, what it means is that the joint is stable when it's dorsiflex because the, the, the socket is completely filled by the talus. But when we plantar flex our foot so we point the toes downwards, what actually happens is that the, uh, the posterior part of the talus here is now sitting in the socket. It doesn't fill the socket. There's several millimetres on either side where it can move. And this is when the joint is unstable and this is when you have injuries 
as I'm sure those of you who wear high-heeled shoes and the shoes that people are wearing these days are ridiculously high-heeled. So I am sure that a number of you have had injuries while you are wearing high-heeled shoes. Always your foot injuries occur when your foot is in the plantar flex position, right? Now, the most common injury that we see is excessive inversion. So we fall on our ankle like that and the foot is forced into inversion, okay? I found this diagram in more. This is a diagram of what happens and how, how many people here have sprained their ankle? Look, it's about, what, a quarter of the class. This is what you did, okay? You fell on your ankle, onto the outside of your ankle, and in so doing, and next time you do it, because those of you who have sprained your ankle probably continue to sprain it, because the ligaments are now a bit weak, okay? And the, usually the first ligament to go is the anterior talofibular ligament. And that's where most of the swelling and most of the tenderness occurs, in front of the medial malleolus. In severe ankle sprains, the calcaneofibular ligament, which is the next one down here, that might rupture. That's usually when you see lots of bruising around the heel. And, there's all, and then the last one to go would be the posterior one. But it's usually the anterior followed by the calcaneofibula. Okay? Um, on the other side, the medial ligament is so strong that it doesn't rupture. Instead, the bone breaks first. Okay? So, you, this is termed avulsion. So, here you can see that the medial malleolus is broken off from the rest of the bone. And in severe cases, you will also rupture the, can rupture the uh, tibiofibular ligaments and fracture the fibula. That's quite common to have a fibula fracture, and that's what often people just call a broken ankle. Okay? So that is the medial one, and that's a far more serious injury, but it's also a lot less common than falling onto the outside of your ankle. Okay? Some of you have probably done this. It happens in skiing accidents and things like that. Although ski boots have been designed now to come up above the ankle, up the leg, so that they actually try to minimise the chances of this injury. Okay? Instead, the knee gets injured now instead. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to move on to the muscles. And I did give you some diagrams there, but I'm not going to draw the muscle diagrams. They're, um, it'll slow me down too much and I won't get to the end. But what we'll do is we will... This is a diagram of the compartments of the leg. And the compartments of the leg are actually really important because people who do a lot of sport often get what are called compartment syndromes. So they get swelling within one compartment of the leg and it's called shin splints. And I'm sure there are people here who like going for long runs who may well have suffered from shin splints, right? So it's important to understand what the, uh, the compartments are. So this diagram here sort of corresponds to that. And we have, it's a section through the leg, through the middle of the leg, anterior up there and posterior. And on this side, will be lateral, and that side will be medial. So our key structures here, of course, are the tibia, which is there. So this here is the tibia, and you can see its subcutaneous surface. Right, that's actually the medial surface of the bone, only covered by fascia and skin. And the other key bone in here is the fibula, which sits there. Okay, now both the fibula is sort of deep in the leg, surrounded by muscles, but the leg is divided up into three compartments by connective tissue. So running across the middle there, okay, is the interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula. There. And on this diagram, this sort of line around the edge there is meant to represent the deep fascia of the leg, okay? Now we had deep fascia in the thigh, the fascia larder, it continues down in the leg and sort of surrounds all the muscles of the leg like a sleeve. And um, outside of that you've got the sort of skin and subcutaneous tissue. Now extending inwards 
from that um, uh, deep fascia are two bands of connective tissue. There's one here and one here. And those bands are known as intermuscular septa. You encountered them, I think, probably when you did the arm. There was intermuscular septa there. So this one is the posterior intermuscular septum. There. And in front there is the anterior intermuscular septum. And basically those two septa plus the interosseous membrane have divided our leg now into three compartments. Okay, this bit out here between the two intermuscular septa is the lateral or perineal compartment. There. At the front here we have the anterior compartment. There and then this at the back behind the intermuscular septum and the interosseous membrane, all of that is the posterior compartment. And that's actually subdivided by another septum, but it's a lot less obvious. Okay, and it's not even marked on this, is it? No, they haven't bothered to mark it. I marked it by dotted lines because it's almost imaginary, but it's sort of there. And that's a transverse intermuscular septum. You don't need to identify it. You can identify the other ones. All right, but this one's pretty small, pretty thin. And that actually separates posterior into superficial and deep. So um, the muscles are also marked here, but maybe as we go along, okay, well, I'll just draw them in. Why not? Why not? Okay, before we start. So I'm running out of colours, but that doesn't matter. Okay, so you can see there are three main muscles in the anterior compartment. There's one on the tibial side, and this is actually the biggest muscle in there, this one here, and this is called tibialis anterior. Okay? Now there are two other muscles, and if you look down and you look at the, the top of your foot, which we call the dorsum of the foot, that corresponds to the dorsum of the hand, which has the extensor tendons on it. Okay? And so we're going to see extensor muscles of the toes here. And we have two of them. There's one sitting there, and that one is extensor digitorum longus. So we don't have a superficialis and a, uh, a deep one here, we have a longus and a brevis. So there's extensor digitorum longus. And then down in deeper, down in here, I'll just abbreviate it as extensor, an EHL is extensor haliusus longus, which is the, the one for the big toe. Okay? So there are our three muscles in the anterior compartment. Now in the lateral compartment, there are just two. There's a deep and a superficial one. Okay? So the deep one is here, and then there's a superficial one on the top. And these muscles are called and there's a bit of a nomenclature issue here. The Americans like to call them fibularis longus and brevis. Okay? So that's actually what's in the textbooks. Um, the other name that I've always used all my life is perineus longus and brevis. So we're going to, you can use either name. Okay? So we have perineus or fibularis, because I think Nalini uses fibularis, um, longus, and then there's also a uh, perineus or fibularis brevis right there. And the longest sits on top of the brevis. Okay. Now, um, I'll come back for the posterior ones, I think. So here's the tibialis anterior. Now, this is the biggest and strongest of the anterior muscles and it has a great big tendon that goes down the medial side of your foot. Okay, and it's tibialis anterior. Now muscles that cross the front of the uh, ankle joint are going to dorsiflex it. Okay, they're all dorsiflexes, those three muscles. This one goes from the, uh, from the tibia 
and the, a little bit from fibula interosseous membrane, big attachment, mainly um, from the tibia and interosseous membrane, and it passes sort of medially across the front of the ankle and comes down and it actually inserts onto the base of the first metatarsal and also um, onto the, uh, the cuneiform bone behind it. Okay, so that's the tibialis anterior. It's a dorsiflexor, but because it goes onto the medial side, it also inverts the foot. Okay, and in this diagram, it's that one there. Now, this is the extensor digitorum longus, so this corresponds to extensor digitorum in the hand. Okay, and you can see that it's, it's mainly coming from the, uh, the fibula and the interosseous membrane with a few fibres there from the tibia. Now, it passes down and as it crosses the ankle, it's going to divide up into four tendons going to each of the second to the fifth toes and they insert onto the, the uh, middle and distal phalanges in exactly the same way as the extensor tendons for the fingers. There's an extra little bit there which is fibularis or peroneus tertius. It's like extensor digiti minimi, I guess, but you don't actually need to know that one. So I haven't put it on the diagram, okay? Um, so this dorsiflexes the ankle and it extends the toes. Extensor hiatus is deep and its tendon's going to emerge between, I'll show you a picture of the foot in a minute, the tibialis and the digitorum tendon and that of course goes down to the big toe and enables us to extend our big toe and it helps to dorsiflex the ankle as well. So they're the anterior compartment muscles. Now they're held down by retinacular and these are thickenings of the uh, fascia. So the one at the top, the superior retinaculum, extensor retinaculum is literally just a thickened part of the deep fascia. The inferior one though is Y-shaped. You see the tendons here being held down onto the ankle bones there. This inferior one comes from the calcaneus on the lateral side and then it's V-shaped. So it has one bit that goes to the medial malleolus and, and uh, sort of to there, and another piece that wraps around and inserts into the fascia on the bottom of the foot. So those, that's the inferior retinacular, but they also hold those tendons down. So here's tibialis anterior, there's the hiatus tendon, and here are the digitorum tendons. You don't need to learn this muscle, but if you're interested, there is a little extensor digitorum brevis with a hiatus bit on the top of the foot. You'll see it in the specimens, but you don't actually need to know it. Okay. So there's what your foot, a foot looks like, and these are the tendons. There's tibialis anterior, great big one, you can all feel that tendon. Next to it is the halicis tendon, and then you can see the digitorum tendons lateral to those. Okay? Um, now the lateral compartment is just two muscles. There's a deep and a superficial one. They basically um, go they essentially from the fibula, down to the foot. Now, the, the, we'll start with the deep one maybe. The deep one's easier. It's coming from the shaft. It's, it's the brevis, peroneus brevis or fibularis brevis muscle. It's coming from the shaft of the uh, fibula. It forms a tendon at the ankle and these tendons wind around the back of the lateral malleolus. Um, yeah, the lateral malleolus. And this peroneus brevis tendon or fibularis brevis tendon inserts onto the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal. And it's sometimes, if you've had a se serious ankle sprain, they'll x-ray your ankle and they're looking for um, where the, the tendons have pulled the bones off, broken the bones. And it's not uncommon in a serious ankle sprain for so that, per that, that peroneus brevis tendon, this one which goes down to the tuberosity of the fifth, to actually evolve the fifth metatarsal. So that can happen. The tuberosity breaks off sometimes during ankle sprains. Okay. Now the peroneus longus or fibularis longus comes from the head of the fibula and the shaft. It's, much, it's a bigger muscle and it becomes tendinous part the way down the leg. That tendon covers the deep, the brevis muscle and also winds round behind the lateral uh, malleolus. And there are fibres there that hold them down. Okay, and stop them from moving around the malleolus. But look what it does. The longest tendon has a longest tendon here, but it also, its tendon when it gets down onto the foot, turns and goes right across the foot 
to insert onto the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform bone. So it actually comes right under the foot. Now these two tendons, when they act, they pull the foot outwards. So this one is the longest tendon is, is dragging the medial side of the foot so it turns out like that. Okay? And that's their function. Now the posterior muscles, you've already done gastrox. I think you did gastrocnemius with the knee, did you? Yeah? But it basically, she might have taken it out of that lecture actually, but essentially what it does is it has two heads one from the medial and one from the lateral femoral condyles and they're just re referred to as medial and lateral heads. They will join up as they pass down the leg. And these are boundaries you may remember of the popliteal fossa. Now they insert into this tendon here which we call tendocalcaneus or more commonly known as the Achilles tendon. Now they're the smaller, there's actually a third muscle that inserts into that tendon and it's bigger than the two heads of gastrox put together. And that's this muscle here on this side which is called soleus. And it's quite a big muscle. And I don't know if I've got a slide of its origin. No, I don't. Okay. So the origin of soleus is its U-shape. So there's an oblique line on the tibia here. It goes up around the, the head of the, the fibula and then down onto the shaft of the fibula. And you can see all these fibres here converging down onto the deep side of tendocalcaneus. Okay? And so both those muscles are acting on the Achilles tendon or tendocalcaneus to plantar flex the foot. Gastrox also helps flex the knee as well. Okay, now um, uh, the other, and together we refer to them, I put it in your notes, as the triceps muscle of the leg. Right? It's sometimes called triceps furae, S-U-R-A-E which is basically triceps of the leg. There's an extra muscle there called plantaris, which is a bit like palmaris longus in the upper limb. It's a forgettable muscle, but it's a useful tendon to have if you need a tendon graft. And sometimes it does rupture in people when they're sprinting. But you, we don't expect you to learn that muscle. It just happens to be here, and you might hear about it. Okay? Now, tendocalcaneus, remember, inserted into the tubercalcanei. Now, there are some deep muscles as well, and... Um, the, uh, the deep muscles oh, on here, if we wanted to draw, we could put, you know, soleus. There's a great big one there. Okay? And then you've got the two heads of gastrocnemius. Lateral gastrox and medial there. Now, there's, there's also some deep muscles down in the leg. The deepest of these is the only one we really want you to know, tibialis posterior. And it comes from the um, interosseous membrane. It's this one here, it's shown there, and from the leg bones, and it winds around the medial side, behind the medial malleolus. And why I mention it is because it inserts onto the tuberosity of the navicular, and then it spreads, sends fibres out to the rest of the nearby bones. Okay? It's important because it acts with um, tibialis anterior to invert the foot. Together they invert our foot. Okay? It also is going to help support an arch, which I'll tell you about later. There are, there's also a flexor digitorum and a flexor halusis in there. You don't need to know the details of this muscle. Um, the flexor digitorum is shown here. It comes from the, uh, from the tibia and it divides into, fire, into tendons going down to the big toe. We also have a flexor halusis tendon, which is coming from the fibula, and that one you can see there. Okay, so we see these long tendons going to the big toes down in the foot. But you don't need to know the details of those. Now, there is a flexor retinaculum. That's those tendons going around the ankle here on the medial side and there's a flexor retinaculum there which holds them down. And it also carries the anterior, posterior tibial vein and artery and the tibial nerve all enter the foot that way. Okay, and you can see the two tibialis tendons, one there, tibialis anterior, one for tibialis posterior and there are foot inverters. The other thing you need to recognise in the foot is the plantar aponeurosis. Now this is the equivalent of the pulmar aponeurosis in the hand. 
and it goes and it blends to the skin above so it stops the skin on the sole of the foot moving around. It comes from the tuberosity from the calcaneus back here and it passes forwards and it's actually going to blend with the, uh, the fascia near the bases of the uh, metatarsals. Okay? And it does send slips down to, to go to tarsal bones as well. But basically you just need to be aware that this exists because a lot of people get a condition known as plantar fasciitis. Some of your parents might have it, where you get an inflammation. You get pain on the sole of the foot and it's an inflammation of the origin of the plantar aponeurosis. Now I mention it, that's just a summary of all the muscles that what they do, actions at the ankle, and you are not required to learn the foot muscles or the layers of the foot, okay? But I want to spend the last few minutes talking about the arches of the foot and um, I've given you some diagrams there for the arches for what they're worth, I don't know where mine's gone. Where is it? Ah. Anyway, I can't find my diagram. That's okay. We've got them here. So in our foot, our foot does not sit flat and it's also not rigid. It needs to have flexibility so that it can sort of act for shock absorption and so that it can also adapt to different shaped surfaces. So we have arches in our foot, as you're probably aware, and Oh, when you, I'll show you a footprint later, but with a normal footprint you don't have the medial side of the foot touching the ground except at the heads of the metatarsals and the heel. And that's because we have an arch there and that is known as the medial longitudinal arch. It's basically formed by the, uh, I think I've got more details of it in a minute. Oh, hang on a second. We've also got a lateral one on the lateral side of the foot. It doesn't sit flush on the ground either. Okay, we've got a slight arch there. And the other arch that we've got is that the tarsal bones and all the metatarsals, if you look at them from front on, are actually in a, forming a transverse arch. It's like a half arch, so the two feet meet together and form a whole arch. Okay? Now, the medial um, longitude... Oh, I left this slide in. I've got another one after this. I put a new one in last night and I meant to take this out. <laughs> anyway, um, in your notes, I've listed... The, uh, the structures that form the arches, okay, and I told you before that the medial arch was basically formed by the, the medial metatarsals, the, cu the medial cuneiform bones and the navicular as well as the, uh, the, the calcaneus and the spring ligament, surprisingly enough. Now this, this arch collapses, this arch is bearing weight because when we, weight is transferred from the leg down to the foot, it comes to the talus, 50% goes forward, 50% goes backwards. And there's the little um, uh, sesamoid bone I mentioned. Okay? And where the weight's actually coming down is here onto the head of the talus. So it is quite common for the head of the, the, the spring ligament to stretch okay? so that the head of the talus falls down. It can no longer support the weight there. Now there's, this, is, this is known as a flat foot and or pest planus. I've got a picture of it there for you a little bit later. But it can occur either genetically. Some of you have flat feet. You were born with flat feet. Your parents have flat feet. And they probably don't cause you any problems because of the, the shape of the, you know, your, butt, your foot is entirely adapted to that. For other people, especially if you're standing for long periods of time and not walking around, Okay, the spring ligament can become stretched and that causes pain in the arch and it causes us to fall down. This is the sort of shop assistants who are standing all day behind a counter but not actually walking around. Okay? And so we need to understand what supports the arch okay? and there are a number of things. So especially the medial arch because that's the one we have trouble with. So the things that are supporting it there include the plantar aponeurosis, you can see that's like a bowstring, you know, to the foot. We've got the long and the short plantar ligaments and very importantly the spring ligament. So they're all helping to keep the foot into that arched position. On this side, there's the perineus longus tendon and that's actually what causes the transverse arch. Okay? 
But I found that slide. I think that's a nicer slide. And that one's out of Moore, Moore's Anatomy. But um, what this one does is it shows us all the ligaments, but it also makes the point that muscles are important as well for maintaining the arches. So that the muscles themselves, action in those muscles helps support us. So that's why people who are walking around all the time don't get fallen arches, but if you're standing still you will because you're not, your muscles are not acting to support the ligaments there. And the key muscles that are important here are tibialis posterior, which comes down here and partly it goes partly underneath the uh, spring ligament, which is this one. Also, the, uh, the flexor halius is longest tendon. You can see there, hooks under the subdentaculum tali and underneath the joint here and helps to support the spring ligament. The other one is this one, which is the tibialis anterior and it's like, you know, it's suspending the arch a little bit and so it also assists. So walking around is good because then your arches don't have too many problems, okay? It's when you're standing still. So that's a diagram of what actually happens when, this, uh, when the arch collapses, okay? And the talus, I mean, the navicular comes to sit down on, you know, contact the ground. And there's a diagram from Moore showing the footprint. So there's a normal footprint and this is the footprint of a person who has a fallen arch or a flat foot. And I think that's it. Uh, here he is. <laughs> oh, hang on, I better mute that. And I'll mute that one as well. Uh, so on the sand, for this diagram, yeah. so we have a socket here. Yeah, and the spring ligament is part of the socket. So is that actually, I, I, I see my uh, head of a uh, tailor. Hey guys, the uh, in case you haven't registered for more, you don't have to take any more registration. So um, if you still want to come along, you haven't registered, find a friend that you can follow around or you can come as a patient. Um, feet in the dissecting room, just with the tailor's removed, and you look down into the socket. So actually, and there's so articular cat, cartilage. Uh, yes, calcaneus. Cal calcaneus, yeah. yeah. It doesn't actually directly contact with the navicular. Oh no, well it sort of does at the front here. Ah, uh, here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it does a little bit. And I don't really understand um, this tendon. The, this one. Perineus. So, so perineus, perineus brevis is a deep uh, one. Uh, uh, brevis, I understand. Now, longus goes down, and you see there it's disappearing under the foot. So actually, right, and this down. is it here. So it comes down past the lateral malleolus, lateral. and then goes across the hot, the sole of the foot. So it's going to the to so the medial side of the foot. So it comes underneath. from the back. It goes underneath and around to the base of the big toe. So it's like yeah. 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 <laughs> oh no, that's an in, that's the bottom of the foot. You'll we'll see it in the specimen. You'll see it in the specimen. So like that's the like sole. Like okay. Like yeah, the foot's like planted flex yeah, yeah, in that one to show you where it is. It's probably in another diagram though. Have I got it on the diagram where we actually did the muscles as well? Um, where were the muscles? It's there for the perineal muscle. Where's the diagram of the perineal muscle? Oh no, that's it yeah, there. Yeah, but you'll, you'll understand it when you see the foot, when you actually see the feet. It's on the inferior surface of the foot. So it's actually going as this